dear dhamma friends uh, we are coming to the next part of this uh, mindfulness for young adult session <clears throat> that is a short dhamma sermon and today we are discussing another verse of uh, rhinoceros horn sutta or sometimes called as the kagga visana sutta so as you all can remember that we were discussing this uh, kagga visana sutta for several weeks now and uh, basically this talks about various aspects of the dhamma and uh, how certain incidents have become certain triggering points for certain people to attain pachyaka buddhahood so we know that there are three stages of full enlightenment and that is the samma sambuddha pachyaka buddha and the shravaka buddha samma sambuddha is the person who uh, self enlightened and capable of uh, preaching the dhamma and establishing the sangha order so that many thousands millions of uh, others also able to get liberated and pachyaka buddha sometimes called as private buddha where he too self enlightened but don't establish a sangha uh, this um, order and uh, he uh, seems not capable of uh, explaining the dhamma to deep extent or uh, to ex- um, explain dhamma in detail so that uh, his attainment is somewhat uh, private and then one there is one uh, he is a shravaka buddha where he is an arahant who actually has uh, uh, get some guidance from the samma sambuddha's teaching that is the dhamma and using which he has practiced himself and then has attained and uh, then he is capable of preaching to some extent and they are actually different so certain monks are capable capable of explaining and certain others are not much capable of uh, explaining the dhamma anyway uh, so this particular sutta available in sutta nipata as we discuss is one of the uh, suttas which is attributed to pachyaka buddhas mentioning that all these verses are uttered by pachyaka buddha when they have attained pachyaka buddhahood and uh, they are ex- Ex- explaining their experience so they are mentioning what is the uh, close reason for them to attain pachyaka buddhahood now today actually we have come to a, a one verse which is starting like diswa suvannas pabhassarani kamara kammara puttena sunithithani sangatta manani duve ujasmi eko chare kagga visana kappo now eko chare kagga visana kappo is the term again and again appear in all the verses almost all the verses and uh, it emphasizes the seclusion this whole sutta actually has an emphasis on seclusion uh, practicing uh, in isolation now this is uh, in a way not that uh, one is having any problem with others or cannot deal with others but they prefer seclusion and uh, they consider it as a uh, one way of uh, uh, motivation for their practice so therefore this seclusion uh, therefore sometimes called as viveka is sometimes emphasized in the dhamma now in one occasion one person actually a king Uh, was dwelling in a garden and at that time uh, he had a queen and as well as a uh, slave woman now the slave woman is preparing some uh, sandal uh, powder to apply to the king's head and uh, at that time king was just uh, lying down and the queen was uh, also looking at the king and uh, she is also close by by the way when the slave woman is uh, you know the attendant woman is uh, preparing this uh, sandal powder so she actually had one uh, what you call uh, bracelet 
around her one arm and two bracelets around her another arm. And uh, when she is preparing this uh, sandal wood or sandal powder using, say, assume the left hand, which has a single bracelet, it didn't make much sound. And when she turned to the other hand and she started to use the right hand, which had two bracelets, when it is when she is using, assume that a mortar or something to prepare the sandal powder, so it make additional sound because those two uh, bracelets were touching each other, bracelets were hitting each other. So it may it produces kind of a tingling sound, kind of a echoing sound. You know when there is a, a kind of uh, <clears throat> metal two two metal pieces are hitting each other, touching each other, it produces a little sound. So this particular king had made a kind of a notice of this. So when this woman is using one hand, which has only one bracelet, it is quite, it is, uh, quite silent in a way. Only one sound is available, that is the powdering happens through the whatever the device. But on the other hand, when she changed to the other hand, which had actually two bracelets, when she is using that hand, it made an additional sound because those two bracelets were touching each other, hitting each other. So that has become a sign for this king to reflect. And she, he is thinking, <clears throat> when I am alone, I can be quiet. When I have another companion or many others, then I'll be disturbed. So it is difficult for me to practice. Now, while he is looking at again and again this uh, some sort of this sign, this notice, and uh, how this woman is preparing with an idea that how the companionship, gathering of many people, and too much association is kind of a hindrance. Actually, the queen also has noticed that uh, the king is looking at this woman's hands. And uh, Queen, she thought actually the king has changed his mind and he got a lustful thought towards this uh, slave woman. So what the queen did was, so she came to the slave's place and she asked her to go away. And she herself started to prepare the sandal powder. Now, the queen's both hands had many bracelets, not two, not one. Many bracelets were there in her left hand, on in her right hand, in both hands. Now, King Wen, he is noting how the queen is preparing sandal powder. So it produces a lot of sound because many bracelets were touching each other, hitting each other, a lot of noise is generating. When she is using the other hand, similarly, it is making a lot of noise. So the king become so somewhat uh, desperate about this situation, little somewhat uh, uh, further motivated about the situation because he understood, understood it very well. Now, when there are many people available, so it's very difficult to practice, it becomes a real hindrance so that one loses one's seclusion and a lot of quarrels and arguments and all these things are available when many people were there. So now what the king did was he turned the other side and started to reflect without looking queen. He started to reflect and do some meditation. So he, he got this sign as a good uh, vipassana motivation, kind of insightful practice, insightful incident for him to arouse urge. And now he is thinking, so this is the way of the world, this is the way of the sansara. So when many people are there, many quarrels are there, many arguments are there. When less people are there, less arguments. When I am alone, so I can stay calm. So that is the path that he is uh, sort of uh, reflecting and that helped him to attain Pachyaka Buddhahood. Now, king has now become a Pachyaka Buddhahood and uh, Later, once queen has prepared the powder and he she wanted to offer it to the king 
and he she come close to the queen, uh, king and he asked she asked him to wake up because the powder is available then the uh, king refused that uh, sandal powder and asked her to go away now i am not a king so the others also have heard this uh, conversation and once they approach other ministers and other the people and he mentioned that i am not a king anymore i am a pacheka buddha so this is a interesting part an incident which actually causes this verse to utter now there are some similar incidents happen uh, to other people which are which actually have become certain proximate causes for them to has some insightful practice say for example uh, when uh, venerable patachara when she was uh, as a bhikkhuni was practicing well and uh, one day uh, she is not yet enlightened not an arahant yet and she come closer to the hut the kuti where she is residing and she wanted to wash her wash her foot so there was a water pot and using which she put some water to uh, to her uh, foot and some water actually has absorbed to the ground and some actually has gone little far and she put some more and similarly some have absorbed and some have gone little far so likewise this little incident has triggered some uh, contemplation in her mind and uh, she was thinking that like this some people are after the death so they go to the hell and some may go to the uh, say to the heaven to the heaven realms so likewise this this whole sansara is completely uh, somewhat vulnerable so this has become some sort of a triggering for her mind and she became enlightened by contemplating after this triggering incident so a very incident very small thing by the way very ordinary thing when we look at it we don't even care about it but for her it has become some sort of a sign for her to reflect like in that uh, story the king has noticed how the bracelets are touching each other hitting each other and generating little noise so it has become some sort of insightful practice a triggering point for that king to reflect and there are other incident, incidents like uh, another time uh, probably you have heard that uh, chulla pantaka venerable chulla pantaka was uh, left out and his uh, brother actually chased him away telling that he can't learn any even a single verse for four months so then maha pantaka the brother thought that uh, this fellow is not useful for the uh, not useful for the sasana so he asked him to go away so little chulla pantaka was crying on closer to the uh, jetavaram the gate and buddha has noticed him so buddha approached him and he simply patted him his head and uh, sort of trying to console him and then asked why are you crying then he mentioned that uh, my brother has chased me away because i couldn't uh, remember even a single verse i was trying for four, four months now then buddha actually asked are you are you really want to stay as a monk or you do you really want to go out go back to your home no no i want to stay so little chulla pantaka was uh, actually enjoying the monkhood then buddha mentioned okay this dispensation is mine not uh, venerable mahapantaka so let's go let's go inside so he has prepared the buddha has prepared a kind of a little uh, uh, you know cloth which is, which is a white color cloth little piece of white color cloth and asked him to rub it a little ordinary activity just rub it again and again you are rubbing using your hand rajoharanam rajoharanam now he is simply using a phrase <clears throat> 
and that phrase is like a mantra like a some sort of a, a noting kind of a labeling so he is doing it again and again so it made his mind to concentrate because it's a very simple activity a simple piece of cloth is there and looking at it without looking anything else and he is simply using a term rajo haranam rajo haranam rajo haranam so very simple phrase so this uh, venerable chuldapanthaka's mind becomes so concentrated using that phrase and uh, once his mind is concentrated now he understood now because of the rubbing this uh, previously clean white cloth has become now dirty it has become discolored now it made him some sort of sort of a reflection that this body is impure because of this body's impurities this uh, very white color clean cloth has become uh, discolored so it's a very little incident so that also kind of a triggering point for this little chulla pantaka and at that time buddha uh, understood that when the chulla pantaka's mind is well concentrated as well as his mind has now turned towards vipassana turned towards insight turned towards the impermanence <clears throat> to understand something deeply so at that time he preached them and venerable chulla pantaka was able to attain uh, arahantship now these are very little incidents but when we are using them properly as a very you know kind of proper guidance proper way then it can lead to deep understanding now there is another incident like uh, another monk so he is actually uh, someone uh, of a kind of a student of venerable uh, sariputta venerable maha sariputta who is the chief disciple of the buddha and uh, now venerable sariputta since this monk is uh, quite uh, you know kind of a youth kind of a young adult so he said to practice asubha meditation because sometimes for during this young age a lot of lustful thoughts are there so venerable sar put the thought so it is better to practice a lot of asubha and uh, in order to overcome lust so this particular monk is practicing again and again but there is no any kind of progress in his practice and uh, he is also diligently practicing but the kammathana was not successful and venerable sariputta understood that he is not uh, able to give him proper kamathana proper meditation instruction so what he did was he carried him to the buddha and uh, then he uh, informed the buddha that uh, this monk is one of my student and i am have given him this uh, asubha bhavana the Uh, reflecting about the lord samnas of the body but uh, this monk couldn't uh, get much uh, advancement improvement in his practice using this uh, meditation object could bante help him in uh, for further development then buddha asked venerable sariputta to uh, okay i mean i can do it and then venerable sariputta went away and he asked uh, venerable sariputta to come in the evening to fetch uh, this particular venerable and buddha has given a different meditation object instead of uh, doing asubha bhavana so he has given a beautiful flower so that's a beautiful flower it is not something ugly but a beautiful flower now this monk was so impressed by the beauty of this flower now he is looking at the flower and uh, he is reflecting the beauty now that has sort of blossomed his mind it's his mind has become really uh, happy by seeing the pleasantness the, the the purity and the color the beauty of this flower and his mind was so happy and after a while this this um, he is while he is looking at the flower start to sort of fade away it become discolored and it uh, the petals become uh, discolored some of them started to drop fall so now the monk was thinking 
it was so beautiful some some time ago but now it has become discolored now everything has changed now buddha understood now this monk's mind was so concentrated because his mind was so happy and as a result of that the mind has become concentrated to that particular object to the flower and now he has seen the imp- the, the the impermanence of the of the flower so it has become an insightful practice for him so at that time with the priest dhamma and he too attain arahantship now you can see these are very in a way some small activities or small signs certain marks which these monks are able to apply for their practice so when one is looking at it properly insightfully so you can get that benefit so it's quite interesting and there's another story uh, called venerable nagasamala so he is actually uh, going on arms round in a particular uh, road and at that time uh, he noticed that many people were gathered to a particular place and they are enjoying now you know while going on the road so he is going house to house and there's a particular place many people were gathered and there's a little music is there and many people were gathered now he while going closer to that place that gathering place he look at it so there he found there's a beautiful woman she's dancing she's dancing and many people other people were gathered there and they are clapping whistling and enjoying and all these things now typically what happen is when a monk or whoever looking at this kind of a sight so they also become elated they also become lustful and uh, they also somewhat get distracted but for venerable nagasamala the complete opposite has happened he is looking at the danger in this sight so he is looking at an understanding by looking at this kind of a sight by looking at this sort of a situation how many people are getting distracted how many of them are generating more and more lustful thoughts how many of them get more and more at- attracted towards this sansara they become more deluded so what a dangerous sight it is now this is how vendabal nagsamala look at this uh, incident so when he is looking at like that more and more the danger the disadvantages uh, the consequences of this sort of situation was more evident to him and they he he uses that as a insightful practice and he too became an arahant now you can see if one can look at different incidents sometimes from the outside look we can't say whether it is a some sort of a really insightful incident or really insightful sign or it is a kind of a, a detrimental sight but if the person has the insightful practice or he has the proper vision samaditti or in a way yoniso manasikara looking at it in a proper manner proper direction then he can turn it turn that particular sight sound whatever it is to his benefit when the nagasamala did that this particular pacheka buddha did that the king actually did that so the the two bracelets starting touching each other making little sound so it he, it has become a kind of a nimitta kind of a sign for this king to reflect about the value of seclusion the value of uh, the secluded practice uh, to another person to the uh, uh a kind of a flower at the beauty of the flower make him happy and so the mind be- get concentrated and after that when it is fading away so his mind become somewhat insightful about the impermanence so likewise certain times so how we are looking at a particular incident how we are looking at a flower how we are looking at some kind of a situation actually may help sometimes uh, in our practice so it, sometimes we think that we always have to sit cross legged and uh, 
practice diligently and why we have to do walking meditation. This is the only method, only place that we develop insight. So that is uh, not the proper way. Actually, if we are using, uh, say, Yoniso Manasikara, the vice reflection, so any incident probably can be a kind of a very interesting, insightful practice. And we never know how, so what will, what would be these kinds of insights, insights. And you may be going through the market, you may be going by traveling by the bus, you may be driving your own vehicle, you may be uh, wearing your clothes, whatever the different activities that you uh, do. Probably you may be doing your daily course, so different things maybe. But when you are looking at it in a different angle, probably it can generate kind of insightful, insightful uh, practice. So this is what has happened to in this particular story. So, so it is in a way kind of a skill that we have to develop how to use these various maybe natural incidents or the kind of an incident happens in the environment, how to use that properly in a beneficial manner for our practice. So with that note, I like to conclude today's Tamba sermon. Now I like to open the session for questions. Oh, sorry, about that. Currently, there are five questions. Question number one. Um, mindful walking. Dear Venerable Sir, I've been practicing for some time under your guidance and thank you, thank you very much for this invaluable program. I'm grateful for your service, which led to, um, for me to develop a regular mindfulness Sorry, uh, to develop a regular mindfulness practice. This is uh, regarding being mindful while fast walking for exercise. Due to the lockdown situations, we only get about one to two hours per day to go out and exercise. And I want to make it a reasonable physical activity. This means I have to do very fast walking around the playground or jog slowly. While doing this, I tried to apply the mindfulness, mindfulness technique I used during the walking practice. It is possible to focus on the sole of the foot and keep the attention on the observations. But after some time, when the walking becomes faster and prolonged, I feel it becomes too complicated. Since there are other people around and we have to keep social distancing, I don't want to go to the effortless, effortless detached walking as well. Left and right noting technique is a bit of a burden and stress as well, which I have tried several times. Focusing on breath and nostrils does not work since after some time the breath, um, our breath happens from the mouth, especially when jogging. I then recalled one of the techniques Bhante used in some guided meditation. While breathing in, feel the energizing effect and while breathing out, out, um, feel or observe the calming down effect. I tested this and seems work, seems it's working quite well in high cardio exercise even after running five to six kilometers. After a while, it becomes effortless to be mindful on the energizing effect on the whole body when breathing in and mindfully aware of the calming down of the whole body while breathing out. I don't know if this practice is correct or where it belongs in mindfulness practice or samatha, but it works. Um, normally, I get tired about after five to six rounds around the 400 meter playground but now I can do 10 or 15 and then still feel energized and popped up. Thought of checking with Bhante and sharing this reflection with Metta. That's the end of the question. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, if it is, if you feel that uh, it is working for you, no harm in using it because uh, you are doing some sort of uh, mindfully breathing, breathing in your, at, at the beginning you are emphasizing and uh, you get energized. And you get more emphasis on mindful breathing out uh, on the other time and uh, you get relaxed. No harm. Actually, uh, different incidents can be used uh, for our practice as we even discussed today. So it is our, our duty in a way, our skill, how to use these various techniques for the benefit of our practice. So the breath is one incident or one phenomenon Rising and falling is another phenomenon. Walking is another phenomenon. And maybe you are doing uh, jogging. Maybe while doing that, how to be mindful about the various activities that you feel. Or probably you may be doing some yoga exercises. 
how are you going to use that to do the development of the mindfulness or you may be doing various other daily activities how are you going to use them for the benefit of your mindfulness practice so likewise so we have to find out our own ways and means how to make use of these different uh, say activities for the benefit of our practice so it seems like uh, the way that you have used seems to be a beneficial one a correct one so no harm in continuing that yes question number two of six this is mindful city dear venerable sir during question and answer session and guided med- uh, guided sitting you mentioned about gently observing or be gentle on your focus and attention while practicing i can understand fully focused uh determined at- attention to observe the breath keeping the mind at the nostrils i tried to bring it back immediately when the focus is lost how- can you explain how do we do this in a gentle manner thank you and much merits that's the end of the question yeah actually gentle manner in the sense uh, sometimes uh, we become uh, too too much enthusiastic on such situation we are putting too much effort say probably it can lead to crunching of teeth and you making more effort and you are say uh, you get uh, wrinkles on your eyebrows and probably wrinkles on your forehead and uh, certain parts of your body become tightened so that indicates you are not uh, balancing your effort so the balancing of effort is one of the important aspect of meditation we are uh, at the beginning you probably need a little effort but later as your mind become more uh, tamed more concentrated more calm so then we have to reduce the balance sorry reduce the effort so otherwise mind can't develop further so the too much or excessive effort can become a hindrance and buddha mention or the dhamma it is mention uh, atipangahitam viryam uddachanu patitam samadhi sa paripanto so what that statement says is if you are putting too much effort that itself become a cause for restlessness to arise so we need to therefore manage effort so when at the beginning probably it is true that we need some amount of effort because mind is somewhat uh, uh, vulnerable somewhat uh, restless so we need some uh, purposeful attention but later so now mind has calmed down because we have repeatedly did the same activity applied the mind again and again to the same object for example then as a result of that exercise now mind has become uh, fairly focused so at that time now you don't need to put too much effort if you are putting still the same amount of effort so that actually prevents you from further uh, comprehending the object so when you are going to the comprehension of the object there you need to understand okay the mindfulness has now established now i have to look at this particular object carefully and for that i have to uh, maintain the necessary amount of effort not excessive amount of effort but only the necessary amount of effort so that is why i am uh, emphasizing here so we need to recognize how much effort is needed on the way on the way on the in the sense i mean at the beginning you have some amount of effort as you are going towards uh, another 15 20 minutes you have another level of effort and once the mind is fairly calm down you have to have another level of effort so likewise you have to do this kind of balancing of effort so this is in a way kind of an art that we have to learn practically i can simply tell you but you yourself have to learn how to use this uh, balancing of effort so when you do this proper balancing of effort then only you your mind become more uh, calm relaxed and still more focus on that object and the kind of equilibrium kind of an equipoise has happened in the mind so there's this is something uh, very practical and again kind of an interesting task we have to learn what is really how i am going to put effort and if i am am i using excessive effort am i using only the right amount of effort 
and when i have to use right amount of effort i have to do the balancing so these are the points that we are learning we have to practically learn through our practice yeah uh question number 3 of 6 um actually this one is in singalese and the singalese is not very good is it okay if i present my screen to you bante yeah yeah fine give me a second can you see okay so you want me to read it yes please <laughs> okay then let me try පූජනීය ස්වාමීන් වහන්සේගෙන් අවසරයි දිනපතා පර්යන්ක සහ සතිමත්වීම සම්බන්ධව සම්බන්ධ වේ සවස පර්යන්කයෙන් පසු විවේක කාලය තුල තේකොල ගැනීමට ගැනීමට කඩේට යාමට විය සතිමත්ව එය ගොස් හිතුවට වඩා කලින් ගෙදර ආවේ මෙය මීට පෙරින් පෙරත් සිදු වී ඇත කයෙහි විශේෂ දෝෂයක් නැත එනමුත් කය වෙවුලන ස්වභාවයක් මට කාර්යාට ගොස් වැඩිපුර ජනයා කලබල කතා තියෙන තැන් වලට ගියාම මම ගෙදර ඔය අඩුම තරමේ කාර්යකට යනකන් ඉන්නේ මේ ඉන්දලා ගෙදර ගියාම පැයක් යනකන් පරිසරය වෙවුලන ගැටියක් ආවා බොහෝ විට ගේ ඇතුට වෙලා තනිව ඉන්න කැමති මම තනිවම ජීවත් වෙන්නේ වත්පන් තත්ත්වයේ එනම් කතා බහ අඩු ඇතින් යාම හොඳයි නමුත් නැවතත් රට ඇරි දවසට ජනයා අතරට යාමට සිදු වේ මා ආසය ඇතේ භාවනාවට අනුග්‍රහ කළ යුතු බවයි ඒ මෙවන් අවස්ථාවක සකසා ගත යුතුද ලෙස ඉතා කරුණාවෙන් ස්වාමීන් වහන්සේගෙන් පතමි ඕකේ ඇයි තින්ක් හරි දැන් මම සිංගලින් කියනවා නම් ඒ කියන්නේ අපි මෙතෙන්දී දෙපැත්තම බලන්න වෙනවා ඒ කියන්නේ අපි නිතරම තනියමම ඉන්නවා කියන එක නෙමෙයි මෙතින් අදහස් වෙන්නේ දැන් සමහර වෙලාවට අපි මේ කතා කරන කග්ග විසාන සූත්‍රය දිහා කෙනෙක් එක දෘෂ්ටි කෝණයකින් බලනකොට කෙනෙක් හිතන්න පුළුවන් මේ තනි කරම තනියෙන් ඉඳල කරන ප්‍රැක්ටිස් එකක් තනියෙන් ඉඳල කරන වැඩක් ගැනමයි නිතරම කියන්නේ කියලා. ඒ කියන්නේ දෙපැත්තක් තියෙනවා. දැන් අපි ටික ටික භාවනා කරගෙන ඉදිරියට යනකොට මේ තනියෙන් ඉඳීමත් කරන්න ඕනේ පිරිසක් එක්ක ඉන්න එකක් කරන්න. ඇතරම තනියෙන් ඉඳගෙන අපි හිතේ ඒකාග්‍රතාවය, සතිමත් භාවය, දෙයක් දිහා අසීවුම බලන හැකියාව ඒවා වර්ධනය කරනවා. ඊට පස්සේ අපි තවත් පිරිසක් අතට ගියාට පස්සේ අපේ හිත කොහොමද දැන් හැසිරෙන්නේ හිතේ තියෙනවාද කලබල වෙන්නේ නැති ගතියක් සාමාන්‍ය නම් හිත කලබල වෙනවා පිරිසක් එක්ක ඉන්නකොට අපි ඒගොල්ලෝගේ හැසිරීම නිසා හිත කලබල වෙනවා ඒගොල්ලන්ගේ ක්‍රියාකාරකම් නිසා හිත කලබල වෙනවා ඒගොල්ලෝ ආවේගශීලී වෙනකොට ඔන්න අපිත් ආවේගශීලී වෙනවා ඉතින් එතකොට බැලුවාම නිකන් ඒගොල්ලන්ට පුළුවන් අපිව නිකන් නටවන්න නමුත් ඒ ස්වභාවය දැන් පොඩ්ඩ පොඩ්ඩ අඩු වෙනවා නම් අන්න හරි ඒක බලන්න නම් අපි අනිවාර්යයෙන් මේ පිරිස ගාවට යන්නත් ඕනේ පිරිසක් අතරට යන්නත් ඕනේ ඒ වගේම ඒ පිරිසක් එක්ක කටයුතු කරන්න තමයි අපේ තියෙන දුර්ලතා අපේ මනස කොහොමද ක්‍රියාත්මක වෙන්නේ අපේ තව මොනවාද කෙලෙස් වැඩ කරන්නේ කෙනෙක් එක්ක මම කතා කරද්දී ආව මම යටපත් කරන්න හදනවාද නැත්නම් මම ඉස්පතු වෙන්න හදනවාද නැත්නම් මගේ හිතේ ද්වේෂයක් පහළ වෙනවාද රාගයක් පහළ වෙනවාද කියලා අන්න ඒ විවිධා අන්දමින් අපි අනිත් අයත් එක්ක කටයුතු කරනකොට අපිට අපේම ස්වභාවය හඳුන ගන්න පුළුවන්. ඒ නිසා මුලදී තියෙනවා එක තරම් අන්දමින් අපි තනියම කටයුතු කරන ගතියක්. හැබැයි අනිවාර්යයෙන්ම අපි පිරිසක් එක්කත් කොහොමද කටයුතු කරන්නේ? පිරිසක් එක්ක ඉන්නකොට කොහොමද මේ හිත හැසිරෙන්නේ කියන එක අපි අනිවාර්යයෙන්ම සොයා බැලිය යුතුයි. ඒ නිසා මෙතන පොඩ්ඩක් අන්තගාමී වීමක් තියෙනවා මේ ප්‍රශ්නේ තුල. ඒ කියන්නේ තනිය මිදීමම අත්‍යවශ්‍යයි කියන වගේ හැඟීමක් මේ ප්‍රකාශයේ තුල තියෙනවා. නමුත් ඒක නෙමෙයි වෙන්න තියෙන්නේ. අපිට පුළුවන් වෙන්න ඕනේ හුදෙකලාව ඉන්නත් පිරිසක් එක්ක ඉන්නත් හොඳයි question number 4 of 6 this is mindful sitting dear bante my sitting and walking practice seems going well and i've written reflections several times and received excellent guidance as bante highlights sitting has become really comfortable and i tend to feel and absorb the comfort of half lotus posture which i have trained over a time period even when the body pains arise after 45 minutes i observe patches of comfortableness in the midst of the pain i can endure pain since i know it will turn to this pleasurable comfortable feeling at some point now i realize that i don't have this viewpoint for pleasurable feelings to be composed since it can turn into a painful feeling 
Always I tend to embrace or hug the pleasurable feelings which arise in the body when sitting. This happens especially after the breath fades away and when I'm observing different elemental characteristics appearing within the awareness of the body. Do I have to do something specific about my liking of the pleasurable sensations arising in the body? I feel like I don't have that distance between pleasure and the observation, unlike pain, which I can observe as a third person. Thank you for your guidance. That's the end of the question. Yeah, I think uh, this distance, uh, this objective looking at objective way of looking at them may happen. So as you have correctly mentioned, towards the pleasurable feelings, uh, we have some attraction and we want to keep them. We want to have them and we want to own them. And uh, so that is the attitude we have. On the other hand, towards the painful feeling, we want to get rid of them. Uh, we want to reduce them. So that is the attitude we all have. So, but the, during the Vipassana practice, so we admit that we have this kind of uh, tendency. But anyway, I am trying to observe them. I am trying to be mindful about these various feelings. And as you have mentioned, so these feelings are not permanent. So the pleasurable feelings after some time man can change into painful feeling. Painful feeling also may disappear and then again, maybe a neutral feeling or a pleasurable feeling might arise. So likewise, these things are not certain permanent phenomena. They are quite vulnerable and we have no control at all about them. And if we think that I have to have this pleasurable feeling, I want to own this pleasurable feeling. So likewise, when we are attracted to them, ultimately, we get disappointed because we want to keep them, we want to have them, but they disappear. And if they belong to me, I should be able to maintain them. I should be able to have them as long as I want. But now there is no capacity. Even though I want to have them for a long time, they simply disappear by themselves. So, so this is the point that we need to recognize. Therefore, those are not self. Therefore, they are not under the uh, governability of ourselves. So they have their own agenda. They have their own causes and conditions due to which that they arise. And those causes and conditions are also not permanent. And we have no control over them. So when those causes and conditions change, the resultant either painful or pleasurable feelings also going to change. So likewise, more and more we look at them, this whole situation, this whole phenomena, then it is causing a lot of insights. So we, we actually, we don't need to uh, sort of forcefully arise, where, arouse insights. Rather, when we are mindfully watching how these uh, various different kinds of uh, feelings are behaving, so that helps to generate these insights. So it may be we can understand how impermanent they are, how vulnerable they are. And uh, if we attach to them, how it is causing us a lot of suffering because we want to have uh, pleasure from these pleasurable feelings. But unfortunately, once they change, once they disappear, that we get disappointed. So if we attach to them, how, what kind of a suffering that we may go through? And since they behave the way they want and they don't obey our desires, so how uh, impersonal or non-self they are. So these three characteristics become more and more evident to a person. So therefore, you don't need to worry about the present situation. You can simply continue your practice as you are continuing, as you are progressing so these uh, other, say, pleasurable feelings also start to uh, fade away and you may even use the interest currently you have towards them and you may be able to watch them distantly. Yeah. Question number five of six. This is a general question. Dear Venerable Bhante, how does the Lord Buddha's teaching of Dittave Ditta Matang, Suttave Sutta Matang, etc., to Bahira Dharachia, where he explained the reality of what we deal with or the truth around us when we practice Vipassana. Can we use this as Dhamma knowledge? Chintamaya 
Nyanaya during the Vipassana practice? Many merits there, one Saranai. That's the end of the question. Yeah, actually, it is not a Chintame Jnana. It is uh, actually uh, something that we have to practically uh, experience. So you may get that level. So at the beginning, actually, you may not have uh, that skill. When seeing, so are we able to keep our mind only to the level of seeing? Not generating thoughts around it, not generating any kind of uh, ideas around it, not going to any mental proliferation because of that sight. Are we able to keep our mind quiet? Assume that you had kind of a peaceful mind, unagitated mind, very calm mind, unassociated mind, non-grasping mind. And now assume that you watch something, you saw something. So because of this sight, are you really getting disturbed? Are you uh, making a lot of thoughts around this sight? So then still you haven't come to the level of Bahya Daruchi. But there are situations, there are yogis, so they still see various sights, <clears throat> but mind is not making stories out of them. Mind doesn't make any comments out of that sights. So mind is able to maintain its integrity. Mind is able to maintain its calmness. Mind is not now interested about these sights. Say, for example, you are doing walking practice. And during the walking path, while you are walking, your eyes are open. So even though your eyes are open and you can see various sights, still mind remain sort of constant. Mind remain uh, unagitated and uh, say um, not involved in that sight. So mind, mind has its independence. Mind has its uh, kind of uh, stability. Similarly, while walking, assume that there are various sounds and still mind is not much disturbed and uh, sound is just sound and you have your silence, inner silence. Your mind is not talking. Your mind is not chattering. Similarly, your legs are touching the ground. Now you are not focusing your attention to that touching sensation either. So those touching sensations are not uh, making your mind agitated or making your mind uh, distracted, but you can feel them. So feeling is just feeling. So the touching, touching sensation is merely touching sensation. And similarly, there may be thoughts sometimes popping up in the mind and you simply discard them. They don't develop to the level of rumination, develop to the level of uh, proliferation. So they simply go away and your mind maintain its uh, calmness, its uh, inner silence. So this is something that uh, as you continue your vipassana that you may arrive. So therefore, uh, what is mentioned in the Bahya Daruchirya Sutta is not uh, simply a theoretical stuff. So that is something the Pasana yogis may uh, experience as they progress. Yeah. Question number six. This might be the last one. Uh, general question. Dear Bhante, thank you for your guidance on meditation and Dhamma talks. In recent times, people have different views about the pandemic and how to protect oneself. They may recommend natural methods and not support modern ones like vaccination. I wondered if there is this member of the Sangha who says they are not confident about vaccination, what is the best way to respectfully correct them? I am aware they are respected religious persons with a different approach to curing disease, but concerned about the inaccurate public health messages being sent to their followers. With Metta, that's the end of the question. Mm, actually, uh, the difficult question to answer. Uh, actually, I I like to get the Buddha's approach. Where Buddha has uh, recommended certain medicine. So, the, if you refer Vinaya Vinaya Pitaka, so there is a separate section called uh, Besajja Khandaka, so which has a complete uh, information how much how many medicine was prescribed to various monks, to various diseases. So a lot of medicines are there. 
So it's a complete uh, volume of uh, Khandaka. It's uh, had a lot of information about various medicines uh, that various monks have used and Buddha approved them, Buddha recommend them and uh, Buddha himself has get the service of uh, Jivaka for his illnesses and Buddha himself had various other illnesses and many, many other monks also had many other illnesses and they got the service of the Jivaka and other people. So likewise, uh, these diseases are unavoidable. So we, we should not have to have kind of a, a high-minded idea that I may not get these diseases. So I am uh, completely free from all diseases and I am a superman or some, something like that. So we don't need to get uh, that kind of a high-minded ideal because Buddha himself has approved a lot of medicine and Buddha himself has uh, permitted to get medicine and Buddha has prescribed med- medicine and, and when monks are taking certain medicine, Buddha has approved them. And as you mentioned, as I mentioned, you can refer Vinaya Pitaka Besajya Khandaka, Besajya Khandaka. So it has a lot of information about various types of medicine. Therefore, I mean, if a doctor is prescribing, okay, I have gone through all these different uh, statistics, gone through all these experiments, so I can recommend this particular medicine for you, then we should be able to admit it. And because this is not the area that maybe you are capable or this is not I am capable, but someone else is now capable. So when Jeevata is going to prepare some sort of a uh, medicine for the Buddha when Buddha was hurt by that uh, stone put by uh, Venerable Devadatta. So Buddha didn't deny it. So Buddha allowed it. So Buddha allowed Jeevaka to put that medicine. So this is the Buddha. But probably Buddha might tell him, okay, you don't have to use this medicine. I am the Buddha. I can simply cure this medicine. You don't, I don't need a physician. So Buddha could tell like that. But he didn't do that. So he behaved like a normal human being. So that is where we are grounding ourselves. So Buddha has given that example. So Buddha didn't want to show that he is a superman or he is a kind of an exceptional character who doesn't need any medicine or something like that. So he admitted the medicine. So he got medicine from Jeevaka. So similarly, there are many medicine approved by the Buddha. Now say for example, uh, when monks, uh, when Buddha put the precept that monks should not eat afternoon. So many monks started to become sick. So they, they get in today's terms, this gastritis and all this the diseases. Then Buddha has given medicine. Sappi navanitang telang madhutanitang. Sappi is the ghee. Navanita is the butter in today's terms. Telang is the, you know, the uh, gingerly oil, madhu is the honey, bee honey, panitang is the sugar. So this, this has become some sort of a medicine for the monks and he even permitted it to keep it for seven days and consume. You don't need to re-offer it again and again. Typically any medicine, any, any uh, other food you have to offer on that day in the morning. But here Buddha has given a special permission You don't need to re-offer. You can keep it for seven days consecutively and consume because you can overcome the diseases. Similarly, there are many medicines Buddha has permitted and he understood and he has looked at it in a more, uh, say, human human manner. Yeah, these bodies are prone to various diseases, including his body. So therefore, he admitted accepting various uh, medicines Therefore, I have that kind of an attitude. So if the government and the, say, the doctors, physicians are prescribing some good medicine, so why not use it then? Yeah. Uh, that ends the questions for today, Bante. Um, so I'll just check if there's any more. No. Um, and um, there's also been um, quite less participants, but I think most of them actually... Um, uh, participating in the retreat at the moment. So um, thank you for all those who actually made time to come today. Um, I'd like to, to end the session, I'd like to first thank Bante for giving up valuable time for this program. So 
especially if there's lots of programs happening um, in this ceremonia, and also pass on our merits. Um, and also for the people seen and unseen participating and also helping out with the program. And lastly, to all the participants, because without you, there would be no program. So with that, I'd like to end the program. Teruan Sanai. Yeah, Teruan Sanai.